Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse my voice. I'm Professor Wallace, and I'm chairman of the ILI. I want to welcome you all. I'm going to say nothing, <laughs> which is not my habit. I'll then introduce Yona Alexander, who will introduce our speaker and tell us a little bit about our program. So, Yona, let me turn this over to you. One on the mics, I think we're all going to speak from here. But usually, and I don't know quite what that microphone does. And <laughs> later on, when we have questions, I think there'll be one or two of you have mics and you'll bring them around the room. Okay? So, Yona, please. Actually, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. From here? No, no I think. Okay. It works. Both mics work. If you're speaking to that mic, it will be heard. <laughs> 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 I'm going to be brief. Um, going to be brief. Uh, although I am trying to be an academic, but I will try to finish in just a couple of minutes. I don't have 45 minutes to discuss. It's more important that we welcome our speaker today, uh, Ambassador Stuart uh, Eisenstadt. Uh, number one, uh, we distributed uh, a copy of the program. I see it on your um, desk. We also distributed uh, information uh, on the book itself. And uh, books are here. You cannot miss it up front. That's my copy. So uh, at any rate, uh, after the event, if you're interested to purchase a copy of the book. And um, Ambassador Eisenstadt um, said that they would stay to sign your copy. So I, I think uh, as far as this goes, now I, I would like to uh, first of all welcome uh, everyone here. Uh, many colleagues and uh, friends uh, who came to participate in this uh, very timely and important uh, event. Um, as, uh, as you know, um, Ambassador Eisenstadt has decades of uh, experience uh, in many, many fields as a man of all seasons, so to speak, because um, Obviously, many of you know his work as a policymaker, uh, and uh, many of you know his work as a diplomat, uh, as a scholar, as a, an attorney, as an author, and so forth. So uh, I think we'll have the opportunity to exchange some ideas about someone who can provide some guidance and insight uh, into what works and what doesn't work. And particularly at this time in history, I think it is critical to look at some of the lessons of the past and perhaps to uh, learn what can we do uh, in order to make sure that we um, are trying to build a more peaceful um, and prosperous uh, world. So, uh, again, um, I'm not going to go through his um, bio, and you have the, obviously the information of some, some of the highlights. As uh, you know, um, for decades he served in three different uh, U.S. administrations. And some of his uh, positions were indeed uh, very senior, uh, including the chief White House domestic policy advisor to President Jimmy Carter. And uh, he was uh, the U.S. ambassador to the European Union 
Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade, Under Secretary of uh, State for Economic, Business, and Agricultural Affairs, and Deputy Secretary of the Treasury um, in the Clinton uh, administration. So, uh, for his very extraordinary service in the uh, security and welfare interests of the U.S. and indeed globally, I think he received uh, many uh, awards and acknowledgments for his uh, contributions. And I can tell you, uh, again, on both on a personal as well as academic uh, note, I have that book at my desk to refer to whenever there is some sort of a crisis um, in the United States or, or abroad now, particularly in relation to the Iranian crisis or the Middle East uh, or the so-called the uh, Middle East, uh, <clears throat> the uh, proposal on the Palestinian Israelis, um, other issues all the way from uh, environmental, economic uh, developments and impact. So I try to look at the chapters related to that particularly, uh, particular uh, issue concern, and I learn again and again uh, some of these uh, very important lessons uh, for future. So um, with that, I, I would like to uh, ask him to come up here uh, to uh, discuss some of these issues then we'll try to develop a Q&A uh, session uh, later on. So, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Yona. We've known each other for many decades and I really appreciate your invitation, Professor Wallace. And uh, it was particularly kind of you, given the weather, in case I fell and broke a leg, that you brought my orthopedic doctor, Ricky Ruff, here just in case, <laughs> and his wife. So I'm going, to, uh, first of all, on the book, uh, I'm having politics and prose sell it at half price, $20. I'll pick the difference up, uh, given the uh, fact that we're in an academic proceeding. And I'm going to do something a little different. I've given probably 60 book events all over the country. Uh, and rather than spend my usual 35 minutes on the book, what I'm going to do with your permission is I'm going to give maybe a 15, 18 minute summary of what normally I would put as 35 minutes and then spend the balance of the time, maybe another 20 minutes on the Middle East today, um, which I think will be perhaps more relevant and, and if not more interesting, at least certainly more relevant. So let me start by saying that uh, Jimmy Carter put Harry Truman's famous slogan, the buck stops here on his Oval Office desk. And both President Truman and President Carter left office highly unpopular. Truman is now remembered much more for his achievements and his failures. And I'm hopeful that my book will put President Carter's presidency in a broader context. Uh, it is not a puff piece, the reason that it's gotten great reviews is that it's honest and candid uh, about his mistakes and mine. It's not a book that could have been named if he had only listened to me. <laughs> but I think I show in this book that he is perhaps the most underrated, unappreciated, and accomplished one-term president we've had in modern history. 70% of all of our legislation was passed. He honored the institution of the office and the independence of the Justice Department, the importance of the press. Walter Mondale, as vice president, said, we honored the truth, we kept the peace, and we obeyed the law. Now, I tell in this book the imperfections and mistakes, which I summarize as four I's, inflation, Iran, 
inexperience by the president and his so-called Georgia mafia, and inter-party warfare with the liberal wing of the party headed by Ted Kennedy would split the party and help Ronald Reagan get elected. And if that sounds familiar today, I'll let you uh, take it where you wish. Uh, and as I said, these are all legitimate. I deal with all of these, but they have obscured an enormous array of lasting accomplishments at home and abroad. I based the book on 5,000 pages of contemporaneous notes, which I took, a habit I've had since college and Harvard Law School, and on over 350 interviews. It's important to understand the Carter presidency to understand the era in which we govern. It was an era in which the post-World War II cons consensus had begun to break down with the war in Vietnam, our first lost, urban violence, and the whole set of new social and environmental movements from black power to women's rights to pro-life and something critically important to today's politics was the rise of the evangelical movement as a political force. We won every single Southern state except Virginia in 1976 and lost virtually every one of them except Georgia in 1980. Now there were a whole raft of reasons, but not the least of which was Jerry Falwell having catalyzed this evangelical movement into a major political force. And then Ronald Reagan very adroitly marrying that movement to Richard Nixon's so-called silent majority of disaffected blue-collar workers. And that's really the base of Donald Trump's coalition to this day. So it's very much enduring. Abroad, and I'm going to again spend most of the even truncated time talking about Carter's accomplishments abroad, but abroad, it was also a time of enormous flux. The Soviet Union was at the apex of its power with huge buildups on land and sea and in the air, fomenting communist revolutions through Cuban proxy troops in the Horn of Africa, invading, as we'll talk about shortly, Afghanistan, uh, and even supporting so-called Euro-communist parties in Western Europe. It was a decade in which a new major political force arose abroad, the People's Republic of China, which of course now is a very major power economically uh, and militarily. It was a decade in which a Polish-born priest became Pope John Paul II and gave hope along with Carter's own human rights policy to those living behind the Iron Curtain. And it was a decade as well in which Israel had come as close as it ever has, and I hope ever will have to come, to liberally losing its existence in the 73 Yom Kippur War. And it was also a decade in which a new revolution, which I'll discuss more in the future, the balance of the speech, the Iranian revolution really engulfed us. So let me just really tick off in the briefest sense uh, the domestic uh, accomplishments. And I see my friend Ford Rowan here from our, our past uh, UNC days. So let me just real quickly touch on just the highlights of the domestic. Then I'll spend a little more time on the foreign, and then we'll go to the uh, balance of the Middle East today. The energy security we enjoy today, which the president talked about as energy independence, we don't, we aren't energy independent, which he talked about it in the State of the Union, rests on the foundation we laid with three major energy bills, which deregulated the price of crude oil and natural gas to permit domestic production. And that's basically the reason why we have this enormous outpouring of natural gas and oil. We were importing 50% of all of our energy when we left office. We now are a net exporter. It was done in a way you wouldn't see today, in a bipartisan way with natural gas, which was a 20-year problem that no one could break. We did. We had two conservative Republican senators and two liberal House members in the map room of the White House where 
President Roosevelt followed the course of World War II and got them to agree on a common formula for natural gas deregulation, something you wouldn't see for sure today. He was a consumer champion, deregulated all modes of domestic transportation, rail, truck, and most important for you and I as consumers, airlines. The reason we have competitive prices today, the reason perhaps it doesn't seem so great if you're in the middle section of row 36E, we have full uh, loads is because we allowed competition in, uh, in the airlines. And then we didn't stop there. The cable era began as we began to deregulate telecommunications and, and even deregulated uh, uh, and ended prohibitions, uh, restrictions on uh, the flow of, uh, of uh, new uh, craft beers. He was the greatest environmental president since Theodore Roosevelt. We doubled the size of the entire national park system with the Alaska Lands Bill over the fierce opposition of Senator Ted Stevens from uh, senior Republican from the state. And in typical Carter detail fashion, we, he put a giant map of the state on the Oval Office rug, got down on his hands and knees and pointed out to Stevens where every river, whatever mountain stream would be, what would be available for, for development, what would be protected. And the 80 million acres protected to this day which many of you perhaps may have seen, if you haven't, do it quickly because it's evaporating with global warming, uh, is due to Jimmy Carter. In an ethically challenged Washington, every single piece of ethics legislation, every single piece, 78 law disclosing assets going in, restricting gifts when you're in office, limiting your capacity to lobby your agency afterward. The special counsel, that's where Mueller came from, was what we had started then, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the merit selection of judges, all of these things occurred. I, I am forced to tell you one anecdote about the gift limit which caught me. And that is we had a $25 limit on gifts. Uh, I got, uh, as a result of a, a magazine article profiling me and saying I had a great love for the little one cent Tootsie Rolls that many of you may remember when we grew up. I got a mammoth box of Tootsie Rolls and Ricky and Jody know my kids and I, I they were like five and seven and I was going to be father for life when uh, I brought it home only to find out from our ethics office. He said, damned if I'm going to count every one of these Tootsie Rolls, but it may be more than $25. So I returned it with a high pollutant letter saying, I'm sorry, you know, we're in a post Watergate era and we have a higher ethical standard. About a year later, there's a profile in another business magazine of the Tootsie Roll company and a CEO says, Eisenstadt tried to have it both ways. He sends us this high and mighty letter. We open a box, it's empty. So <laughs> I'm still trying to find a secret service agent who stole my Tootsie Roll. <laughs> this Southern president from the deepest part of the deep South Double the number of African Americans, quadruple the number of women on the federal judgeship, uh, judgeships, and he appointed more minorities and women to senior positions in his administration than all 38 presidents before him put together. We created with Mondale the modern vice president, making him a real uh, partner. And one of those eyes, inflation was indeed a domestic Achilles heel. It was high when we came in, it was a whole decade of high inflation, but it got higher when we were in office, in part because of the Iranian revolution that caught off of oil, but it got to double digit range. And here is where Jimmy Carter really was at his best and typified the way he approached his position. His strength and his weakness as a politician was the same. His great strength as an incredible campaigner was he believed you parked politics at the Oval Office door when you came in and did, quote unquote, the right thing. But that was also a weakness because a president has to be politician in chief. He has to nurture a coalition. And in inf dealing with inflation, he brought us in to the Oval Office in the middle of 1979 with a re-election year approaching, and he said, I've tried everything to deal with inflation. 
I've given five speeches. I've had voluntary wage and price guidelines with sanctions. I've had to cut domestic spending to satisfy financial markets and alienate the liberal wing of the party and the process. I've had two anti-inflation czars. Nothing's worked. I'm going to give the economy the toughest medicine it can take. I'm going to appoint Paul Volcker to head the Federal Reserve. And he knew in advance, because as I described in graphic terms in the book, a fantastic one-on-one -on -one session in which Volcker said to him, if you appoint me, I'm going to tighten the money supply. I'm basically going to squeeze inflation out of the system. It's going to cause higher unemployment and interest rates in your re-election year. If you're not prepared to back it and you're going to start pointing the finger at me, like our current incumbent does against Powell because he doesn't cut rates enough, don't appoint me. I won't take the job. Carter said, you take care of the economy, I'll take care of the politics. And it worked. There's no economist, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, any of Volcker's successors who won't tell you the reason we have 2% inflation today is because Volcker established the credibility of the Fed in dealing with it. And it dropped like a rock after Reagan's first year in office. Not early enough to help Carter. Now let's talk quickly about besides saving New York City and Chrysler from bankruptcy, let's talk about foreign policy accomplishments and then we'll go to the Middle East abroad. His greatest accomplishment was without question the Camp David Accords and the Egypt-Israel Peace Agreement. I think it's the greatest act of presidential personal diplomacy in American history, far exceeding Woodrow Wilson's uh, peace treaty uh, in uh, the end of World War I. He negotiated with 22 draft agreements between Menachem Begin and Sadat. We put them together the first day after Sadat's historic trip to Jerusalem, which is a story in and of itself. And it was like two scorpions in the bottle. They had spent six months fruitlessly after Sadat's historic visit trying to negotiate what Sadat called no more wars. Well, that's not an agreement. What does that mean? And they couldn't agree. So over the objection of virtually everyone in, in a senior position, he swung for the fences and brought them to the presidential retreat at Camp David for 13 days and nights, 22 draft agreements, which he negotiated, and then threw in two personal touches. One is on the first Sunday of the 13 days, he took Sadat and Begin in his presidential limousine with Sadat on the right, Begin on the left, to, to the Gettysburg battlefield. And he did it because he wanted to dramatize for them what the five wars between Egypt and Israel had meant. And it was time indeed for an, an agreement. It had a quite interesting effect. Sadat was a general. He had studied uh, the military uh, doctrines in the United States as well. He knew all the problems that the Confederates had at uh, Gettysburg, including Pickett's last charge, which was a little uncomfortable for Carter as a Southerner, but okay. Begin was anything but a general, but he was a Lincoln scholar and on the spot verbatim gave the Gettysburg Address of Abraham Lincoln. It was really quite dramatic, but with all of that and 22 drafts, the last Sunday, the 13th day, when everybody agreed, if we can't do it, we're out. Carter tried another personal touch because Begin came to him and said, Mr. President, I'm out of here. No more compromise. I can't make any more. So Carter realized this would be catastrophic. It would be catastrophic for Sadat to go back empty-handed. It would be catastrophic in terms of inflaming the radicals in the region, like Hafez al-Assad, the father of the current dictator, and it would be catastrophic for his own administration. So having studied in detail the CIA profiles of Sadat and Begin, having talked to his two ambassadors at length to know where their red lines were, he had eight copies of the original photo taken of himself, Begin, and Sadat coming into Camp David, got the names of each of Begin's grandchildren, personally autographed it to them with hope for peace and walked it over to 
Begin's cabin and handed him the eight photos and then saw Begin vocalize the names of each. Begin's lips quivered, his eyes teared, and he said, I'll make one last try, and he put his bags down, and that's how we ended up with Camp David. But people think that was the end of it. It wasn't. And if you want lessons for today, it is you have to be a trusted intermediary by both sides to succeed. The Camp David Accords was a framework for peace. It was not a treaty. And under the Camp David Accords, three months were to to go by, that's the period in Camp David, for converting this into a binding treaty between Israel and Egypt. And five years for so-called full autonomy for the Palestinians. There were no Palestinians at Camp David because the PLO had unfortunately been in 74 given the mantle of representing them by the Arab League and they wouldn't accept UN Resolution 242, land for peace, so they couldn't participate. Okay, so three months go by, four months go by, five months go by, no treaty. And here I'm not exaggerating, Carter, over the objection of everyone, decides to go to the region and do shuttle diplomacy between Cairo and Jerusalem. Three days go by. We narrow the differences. Again, we're not there. Air Force One is now refueled. The airspace has been cleared over Ben Gurion Airport. Carter and Rosalind are getting themselves ready to leave in the presidential suite at the King David Hotel. And Begin calls up and says, I'd like to see the president before he leaves. And we all thought, well, it's just saying, thanks for coming. Sorry, it didn't work out. So while, while we're there, Carter's not yet dressed. And he says, please entertain the prime minister until Rosalind and I are ready. So Begin says, you know, boys, this is a very famous hotel at King Dave. We, yes, sir, we know that. But not for the reasons you think. When I hit it, the Irgun, I blew it up when the British were here, but I don't, I'm not going to do it until the president leaves. Don't worry. <laughs> and he went up to the presidential suite. That's where the treaty was reached. They come back down on the elevator of the historic King David. It breaks between floors. The Secret Service has to pull them out butt first, and I call it the breach birth of the treaty. <laughs> Human rights became a center of Carter's foreign policy. And every president is judged by that standard. It was not a naive notion. He wanted our domestic, our foreign policy to reflect our domestic values of democracy, tolerance, free press. But it was also a way of combating the Soviet Union for the hearts and minds of people around the world. He applied it in Latin America to the dictators there and really catalyzed the democratic movement, which is with us still today, and he platted to the Soviet Union. He championed the rights of Soviet Jewry. We doubled the number of Soviet Jews who left. He saved, according to Sharansky's own memoirs, his life. Sharansky was the leading refusenik, of course, then went to Israel and had a great career. Uh, by saying, in the midst of his trial as a quote-unquote U.S. spy, Carter said that's nonsense and that helped save his life. But Carter also did something that's most unappreciated. I give full credit, and he deserves it, to Ronald Reagan for building up our military and help bringing the Soviet Union to its knees. But we started it. We reversed the post-Vietnam decline in defense spending, and every single weapon system that Ronald Reagan deployed, the, the mobile MX missile, the long-range cruise missile, the stealth bomber, intermediate nuclear forces in Europe, we green-lighted every single one of them. And then, in what even conservatives concede was Carter's finest hour in terms of defense and foreign policy, we took an extremely tough stand uh, against the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. I could go into that in more detail, but we don't have the time. China normalization, again, I give, in this case, Nixon and Kissinger great credit for the outreach to China. They did not establish diplomatic relations with China because of the force of the Taiwan lobby and the Republican Party. We did. We severed relations diplomatically with them, established a defense and cultural relationship, which exists to this day. And I was in the cabinet room when Deng Xiaoping, all four foot 11 of them, came 
uh, and I kept saying to myself, how does this little guy control a billion Chinese? And when we're in the cabinet room, he says, and this will seem like deja vu all over again, Mr. President, I appreciate what you've done. Uh, it's historic. But what we really need now for me to turn around the Chinese economy is to get the most favored treatment for our exports in terms of the lowest tariffs you give to your most favored trading partners. And he said, I know that there's a law, it was a Jackson Vanek law, that bars that kind of favorable treatment for countries that control uh, their immigration and restrict it. But he says, we don't. And he takes a little White House notepad, pencil, and pushes it over to the president and says, you write on here the number of Chinese you'd like us to send you each year, a million, 10 million? <laughs> and Carter laughs and says, I'll tell you what, we'll make a deal right now. I'll take 10 million Chinese a year if you'll take 10,000 American journalists. <laughs> now, when I end up with Iran, that will get us into the balance of my talk about the Middle East today, because Iran, another one of those eyes, was in fact the coup de grace. And I'm extremely candid in this chapter. I'm doing, a, we got a paperback coming out now and I've interviewed even additional people. I don't think it's fair to say Carter lost Iran, the Shah lost Iran. But having said that, the mistakes were enormous. Number one, it was in my opinion, I say it in the book, I say it to you now, the single worst intelligence failure in American history, more than the absence of weapons of mass destruction under George W. Bush. We had installed the Shah back on his throne in 1953 with MI6, the British, deposed a popular elected prime minister. He became the favorite, our guy in the Middle East for six presidents, Republican and Democratic, including Carter, open shopping list. And yet the CIA didn't know that his domestic support rested on quicksand. He had alienated wide swaths of society. They didn't realize, can you imagine this, for five years he was secretly getting cancer treatments for a deadly form of cancer. They didn't appreciate the impact of the cassettes, the sort of social media of the day that Ayatollah Khomeini was sending from his exile outside of Paris back to Tehran. We knew he was sending them, but not the impact it was having. Absolutely unacceptable intelligence labs. I think that we could not have saved the Shah, but I do think with appropriate action, we might have prevented Khomeini from coming back. We can talk about that. The next mistake is the hostages are taken. This is one instance I do wish he had followed my advice. I recommended, as did Zbig Brzezinski, National Security Advisor, an immediate blockade of Karg Island where 60% of Iran's oil comes. Now, the argument was, well, they'll start assassinating our hostages. I don't believe that. I think they would have known it would have started World War III. There was a concern that the Soviets might try, if we mine the harbors, use their minesweepers to, in effect, endear themselves to the new regime. But I think it would have worked. We'll never know because it wasn't followed. Instead, the president met with the hostage family, said our number one goal is to get your loved ones out safe and sound. And he did, but only after 444 humiliating days. Walter Cronkite, at the end of every broadcast, the dean of reporting, those are the days when there were three networks and you actually believe what you heard. Uh, and he would say after every broadcast, day 105, day 307, day 406 for the hostage crisis, it was like dripping a drop of poison every day. And Carter made a mistake of holding himself up in the White House, canceling appointments. It just caused more attention. And then the hostage rescue was a failure, carefully planned but a combination of hydraulic failures and sandstorms, which I discuss in great detail. You could make a movie out of that. If there's one positive thing that came out of Iran, and it's the only one, it is that after the hostages were taken, Carter signed an executive order to expel all Iranians. And there were over 100,000 students, business people. 
And I got a call from some young Jewish Iranians who were studying here. And after a series of meetings, they basically said, if we have to go back to Iran, it's a death sentence. That the head of our community, Al Haghani, has been assassinated and dragged through the streets of Tehran. You have to find a way to keep us here. And we did through, again, actions which you'll read in the book. We also did the same for Christians and Baha'is. And we got 50,000 Iranian Jews who were in Iran out by having our consulates allow them to take asylum uh, until the Shah was returned to the throne, which we knew would not happen. And there are now over 100,000 Iranian Jews and Christians and Baha'is in the U.S. today. So I'm going, again, I wish I could go into more, particularly the personalities of Carter and, and others, but I don't think our time permits it. So let me talk now, do that in the question period if you want. By the way, one of the lessons, Yona and President Wallace, in terms of dealing with the Iranians, in my opinion, is they only respect power and force. Now, I want to talk about new realities in the Middle East from Jimmy Carter's era up through the Obama administration and to today. First, we see a dramatic change in the entire structure of the Middle East because of the common threat that Iran poses to both Israel and to the Sunni states. This has caused an incredible, almost unimaginable realignment of power, plus the growth since the Carter era of Israel as a regional economic, military, and intelligence power. I got a a dose of this when I visited for a week the UAE, uh, United Arab Emirates, in April of 2019. There's a Mossad mission there. This year, 2020, there will be an above-ground synagogue. When I was there, there was a hidden one. It'll be a grub ground in a place called the House of uh, Abrahamic Religions. I went to the site of the 2020 Expo that will be in the UAE in uh, the fall of this year. Israel's pavilion will be front and center. When the president announced his peace plan, can you imagine that this would have occurred three years ago, five years ago? The ambassadors of Oman, by Bahrain, and the UAE were there. There was virtually no criticism of any significance by any of the Arab countries, including the Saudis and Egypt. There's intelligence sharing going on by Israel with those states against both ISIS but also Iran. A second major change is the de-emphasis by this administration of the Middle East. And that's based on two things. The first is the president has said publicly and repeatedly, we don't need Middle East oil. We're energy sufficient. And that is not totally true, but it's significantly true. We are much more self-sufficient as exporters rather than huge importers. A second reason for this change in, in policy this de-emphasis on the Middle East, is the so-called America first foreign policy, which is really, this is obviously a phrase that came from Charles Lindbergh. It's really neo-isolationism. An end, as the president calls it, to endless wars in the region. And that's been implemented by keeping only a token of a couple of hundred American forces in northern Syria by pulling the rug out from under the Kurds who were our allies in fighting ISIS there, reducing forces in Iraq, although there is a reintegration of a couple thousand more now, but certainly cutting them out. And we will see surely before the election an Afghan peace plan, which will be a basis for the withdrawal of most, if not all, American and NATO troops. 
Now, just like in physics, where nature abhors a vacuum, the same is true in geopolitics. And as we withdraw, and it's palpable, it's absolutely palpable. I spend time in the region. Someone's going to fill that vacuum. And it's filled in two ways. The Chinese are filling it economically by the Belt and Road Initiative, by pushing the UAE, uh, Huawei as the 5G backbone. Just one anecdote, when I was uh, in the UAE, I met with uh, a minister called Al-Alama, a member of the royal family who has the incredible title of Minister of Artificial Intelligence. I'm not sure there are many governments that have that. And he said to me, what are we supposed to do? You've got 5,000 troops here in a major naval force. You're telling us not to accept Huawei for our 5G network because of security concerns. He said, when we had our request for proposal, you know, he says to me, how many American companies bid? Zero. The only Western company was Ericsson. They were substantially undercut because of the subsidies that Chinese give to Huawei. And I'm sure that you'll see, just as, by the way, Boris Johnson, the president's great friend, did in England, just in the UK, just in the last week or so, Huawei will make its way there. But more insidious, really, and more significant, is this vacuum is being filled by the Russians. The Russians were out of the Middle East after Sadat expelled the Soviet advisors in 1973, they, we were the dominant force across the region. We negotiated the agreements. That's dramatically changed. The Russians now have a warm water port in Syria. They dominate because of the help they gave Assad when he was on, almost on his way out. They are the dominant force. Here, although I disagree with them on many issues, Bibi Netanyahu has established a very important relationship with Putin, and Putin basically has put certain limits on the Iranian presence in, uh, in Syria. They want to build not only a permanent military establishment, they want their missiles aimed at Israel, which would be incredibly difficult. I mean, there is already a sort of hot war between Israel and uh, Iran. In Syria, multiple bombings of that site with Soviet acquiescence, multiple bombings of, uh, tr of truck transports going from Iran through Iraq to Lebanon, Baqa Valley, and Syria. Um, so this is a very important factor with Russians. The second thing with Russia, which again would have been absolutely unimaginable, is that they are now selling SS-400 missiles to Turkey, our NATO ally. My God. There's supposed to be interoperability of Western forces. In addition, as we speak, the Russians are negotiating civil nuclear agreements with Saudi Arabia and with Egypt, our two closest Arab allies, and arms agreements with them. Now let's go to Israel and the peace process. The president has departed from decades of bipartisan presidential policy in the Middle East, which were always pro-Israel in terms of defense needs, but sought to be trusted intermediaries of both the Palestinians and the Israelis for a two-state solution. That has certainly gone by the boards with the movement of the embassy to Jerusalem, which, by the way, I favored, but it should have been tied to some concessions by Israel or a clearer statement that we look forward to the day when we can have a U.S. embassy in East Jerusalem and a two-state solution, the recognition of the annexation of the Golan Heights, uh, and it now seems from the peace plan, eventual acceptance of the annexation of the West Bank. Now, I want to put this into an important context. This peace plan does have positive aspects. The economic dimension for the Palestinians is something they won't take up but should 
even in the absence of political progress. It, for the first time, does assert the president's authority behind a two-state solution, and the prime minister accepted that, although Likud's official position now is against the two-state solution, but the prime minister did. It has a four-year freeze on new settlements, giving the Palestinians some time to proceed. But having said that, the plan, I think, is extremely negative in the long run for Israel's security. And let me try to put it this way. With all the cataclysmic changes I've talked about, the movement of the Sunni states toward Israel and again against Iran, a divided and weakened and totally dysfunctional Palestinian leadership. And I've dealt with Arafat like a half dozen times personally. They rejected the Clinton parameters, which were given them 95% of the West Bank and East Jerusalem as a capital. They rejected all merits offer in 2008 of 96% of the West Bank. They rejected the Obama parameters in 2014. They just hopeless when it comes to the peace process. But having said that, with a divided leadership, with the Sunni states now basically in Israel's corner, with Israel's economic might, with a very strong administration support for Israel, Israel does not have to deal with the Palestinians. They can really do what they want with them within some limits. Is this good for Israel or not? It depends on what kind of Israel you want. Because under the plan, the Palestinians get only 60% of the West Bank. And of that 60%, none of it is contiguous. The only way you have a state of any contiguity is supposedly with underground tunnels and overpasses, which will be controlled by Israel. No contiguity at all. No common border with Jordan, so they can't leave. And there are 82 settlements in the middle of this 60% given to the Palestinians. 82 settlements that will become part of Israel. So in the middle of the 60%, which is already truncated, Israel will have sovereignty over these 62 settlements. Instead of saying there'll be a capital eventually in East Jerusalem, they simply say that the capital will be in a suburban area outside of East Jerusalem, which you can't reach because of the security wall. And so the question is, and I go to Israel like two or three times a year. I've gone 50 times. Ricky, I know you go all the time. I mean, I feel very strongly that the security of Israel is a democratic majority Jewish state. And what we are now on the road to very quickly is a one-state solution for two peoples in which one of the inhabitants of that one state are empowered with democratic rights and the other is not. It will be a boon to those and I do everything humanly possible to oppose it in writing and everywhere else. Uh, the BDS movement, the boycott movement, it's a gift to them. So I call this an existential threat to Israel, not an external existential threat as it had before. It's plenty powerful enough to put that on, even with Iranian problems and so forth. It's an internal existential issue of what kind of state Israel wants to have. And that, I think, is something, in the end, that requires some presidential leadership, as it has in the past, but it also depends on what the people of Israel themselves decide they want to have. The worst situation is to slide into this process of a one-state solution without really thinking through and having a real debate about what the consequences are. Now, there are ways, even with the dysfunction of the Palestinians, 
to deal with this. Not in a totally satisfactory way, but it's sort of what I would call the political equivalent of the medical Hippocratic Oath. You know, a doctor takes an oath saying, if I can't cure the patient, I don't want to make him worse. And that would be, for example, Dennis Ross and I did an op-ed a year or so ago, and we call it Plan B. But it's essentially the notion there are going to be babies born to people in these settlements. But the settlements should be in all new building in the three major settlement blocks right on the green line, which under any parameters, including the Bill Clinton parameters, are going to be part of Israel in exchange for other territory and the Negev and so forth. 77% of all the settlers live in those three settlement blocks. And the notion of now extending this to these 82 settlements, which are just peppered throughout the Palestinian territory of the so-called state, really has dramatic impacts on what kind of a state Israel wants to have. So I'll stop at that. I'll just say one other thing on Iran. I've already talked about the fact that a show of might and force is important. I think the assassination of Soleimani was a positive thing. Although the president got extremely lucky that the retaliation didn't kill anybody, then we would really be in a very different situation today. And we should have thought through that consequence. But the real mistake, in my opinion, and I say this having lost my job to them, I have no, I mean, they're awful. They're an awful regime. Um, greatest state-sponsored source of terrorism. But the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement, and I chaired a task force for five years for the Atlantic Council here. I've met three times with the foreign minister, uh, and the, uh, uh, he was the chief negotiator. It did more than anything possible to dampen their nuclear weapons ambitions. Better to have them in the agreement than outside, now trying to break through it. It undercut our relationship with our allies in the P5 plus one. And there's no question but the economic sanctions that have resulted from our pulling out have substantially weakened the Iranian economy, without question. But what we'll see in a month with the Iranian elections is that the relative moderates, the president, the foreign minister, will probably lose. You'll see more radical forces who will be elected. And it's anybody's guess as to how this end game will occur. But before we pulled out, we should have known what the end game was. What is it we want? We could have within the JCPOA dealt with the sunset clause, dealt with some other imperfections, used our allies to work on their missile program. Now outside of it, and having left the JCPOA with our allies holding the bag, it's more difficult to do that. So having said that, um, I appreciate your uh, patience and your coming. Uh, I'll be glad to take your questions and uh, hope that you'll, uh, you'll find uh, that we have a good Q&A period. I'll just say, going back to, to the Carter book, I'm not nominating the president for a place on Mount Rushmore. But what I am saying is that he belongs in the foothills with a lot of other presidents who have done major things for their country and the world and made this a better place. So thank you. And again, I'll be glad to take your questions. One of the, uh, one of the profiles that I, I have in the book, which I didn't have time to talk about was uh, the, Senate, Senate the chairman of the Senate finance committee at the time, Russell Long from Louisiana who was a very colorful guy, and all our domestic legislation went there. And Russell told me the following story, that his father, who was uh, the, called the Kingfish, he was the governor of Louisiana in the 1920s, uh, staggered up the stairs of the governor's mansion when Russell was a young boy and was holding, as he told me, mama's apron strings and 
suddenly as the governor staggers up the stairs and with a shaky hand opens the door, the governor's mansion, he collapses in the foyer. And Russell holding on to Mama's apron strings says that Mama had her hands crossed and looking down for an explanation as to how this state of affairs could have occurred to the governor of the great state of Louisiana. And Russell said, Papa, without pause, said, Mama, I've completed my prepared remarks. I'll now take questions from the floor. <laughs> so I assure you I've only been given water, but I'll take questions from the floor. Uh, can I ask you two questions, um, Mr. Ambassador? Oh, you, yeah, you're you're okay. um, I'm not related to Huey Long, so I can't tell that story. Uh, two questions. One, let's say that Benny Gans wins the election, the third election of the last few years. What could he do about it? Well, first, he won't, so it's a sort of hypothetical question. I mean, I, from all the best evidence I have of all the people I've talked to, uh, including through yesterday, uh, the president's plan will give some boost to Bibi, but interestingly, the position that Jared Kushner took very unexpectedly, I think, a couple of days ago, saying to Bibi hold off on the annexation until after the election, took some steam out of it because there are people on the far right, even further right, say, why don't you promise this time and again, and this may be another empty bag. So I think we're going to see a similar impasse that neither side will have, including Benny Gantz, uh, 61 mandates. I think the most likely outcome, because nobody wants a fourth election, uh, will be some kind of a unity government. The question is whether what kind of rotation there'll be. There's a precedent for this with Shamir in Paris, uh, and whether Bibi will be prime minister under that scenario, given his well, let me situation. Push it a bit. But, but I mean, Gantz basically accepted the peace plan, but said we shouldn't impose it unilaterally. We should negotiate. They should sit down. We should negotiate this with the Palestinians. You think he could? Oh, they could? The unity government? Could they negotiate with the Palestinians? You know, it's a very good question. I'm not sure the answer is yes, because I don't know what will encourage the Palestinians to come to the table. I mean, leader after leader has basically, I think their basic fear is the following. They did accept the state of Israel in Oslo in 1993, but they can't give up their quote unquote right of return a million and a half Palestinian refugees now to come back to Haifa and so forth. Uh, and they're afraid of assassination. I think, however, the environment is now such that they may have to. Why do I say that? First of all, because for the first time, the Arabs are not giving them a veto right. You know, they had this summit to try to declare solidarity and they got just warmed over gruel. I mean, basically... They're being told by their allies, sit back down and do something. Don't look for us. We're tired of this. So you have that. And I, I think with the strength that Israel has, if there was a true unity government, it might force them to sit down and negotiate. And the economic carrot of the president's plan. My second question relates to Iran. You mentioned the JCPOA. Um, Can I just mention one thing on the economic side? I mean, my 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 uh, mandate in the Clinton administration on the Middle East, Dennis was doing, uh, Dennis Ross, the political, I did the economic. I mean, I went like five or six times between 1997 and 2000. <clears throat> and here's what we had done. We had gotten the unemployment rate in the West Bank down to 8% and in Gaza to 14%. There were almost 100,000 Palestinians who came in every day as day workers to Israel. It's 40% of the total GDP of the West Bank. I went personally to Gaza to see what was called the Gaza Industrial Estate. We had gotten Congress to pay us. It's still on the books something called qualifying industrial zones. So if you had as little as 10% Israeli content in your product in a qualifying industrial zone, and there was one in Gaza, there were, by the way, 13 in Jordan and about five or six in Egypt, as little as 10% Israeli content, you could ship back duty-free to the U.S. And what I saw 
in July of 2000, and we're not talking about a different universe, was the most beautiful thing imaginable. 30 plants, not Israeli plants, European, Japanese, American, using small percentages of Israeli content, employing 1,200 Gazans. And I went into one of those plants. There was only one unarmed Israeli soldier. And those products were being loaded onto a flatbed, flatbed truck. They went right through the Eretz crossing to the airport, which we negotiated with the Israelis and got uh, the Palestinians to have an airport so they could export, cut flowers and strawberries and light industrial stuff. And they were putting another 30 plants in. The foundations were already being laid. And I went back to see Arafat, okay? So we're talking about July of 2000. I also went, by the way, to Jordan. I got to tell you this story. So I go to Jordan to see the qualifying industrial zone there. It's a mammoth. I mean, there's a plant that's the size of a football field. Hundreds, and it's in the Irbid, the northern part of Jordan, which is a more fundamentalist Palestinian part. And so they're like hundreds of women in white fears, and they're sewing and stitching and so forth. And the manager of the plant says, so Mr. Secretary, would you like to see what they're making in this industrial zone? I said, sure. So these fundamentalist women were making lingerie for Victoria's Secret. <laughs> And I said, that's the real peace process. Well, I mean, we had all of this going on. So I go to see Arafat. And before I start talking about all the wonderful things I saw in Gaza and how we're going to do more economically, he says, Mr. Secretary, tell your president, Clinton, not to invite me to Camp David too. I'm sorry, do you, can I help you with something? No, I'm just the secretary. The translator, yes. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. With my southern accent, you may have trouble. So, so he, he says, um, I said, why do you, he said, tell the president the following, not to invite me to Camp David. I said, why shouldn't he invite you to Camp David? He said, because I'm not prepared to make the compromises he wants. Well, he was invited. He was offered 95% of the West Bank, and he turned it down, started the second intifada. In 2007, if you want something even more recent, Sharon withdraws 7,000 settlers from Gaza, leaves the greenhouses there and the infrastructure all destroyed. Instead of getting roses, Israel got rockets. I mean, this has dramatically changed. I see it myself. I have relatives and friends there. In Israel totally changed public opinion that we don't have a, a partner. So I think the best one can do at this point is not to make it worse, but then to hope that with the support of the Sunnis and a common front and say to the Palestinians, this really is your last chance and hope that it works. My second question is about Iran and it's quite different. Uh, you mentioned the JCPOA. <clears throat> You know, if you look at the Middle East from here, Iran is big. I'm not saying they're nice. Um, it seems to me over the next five, 10, 15 years, I wonder what your view is, we've got to do something about Iran. We have to think out what we do about Iran. It's well, I mean, it's a, ma it's a massive land size. It's got over 80 million people. Um, it's interestingly got a more empowered female workforce going back to the Shah than most other Arab countries. It's not an Arab country, it's a Muslim country. But it really has a ferocious, as we had with Car from Carter to this day, a ferociously radical Islamic government. Uh, and the, one of the mistakes we made, and it's easier to see, believe me, in retrospect, we had a number of agreements for the hostages with the government, with their government, and Khomeini vetoed every one. We didn't appreciate, I mean, it's again, it's obvious now, it was not so obvious then, that he was the real power. And that's the same now, except now there's even a greater infrastructure with the Revolutionary Guard, the Al-Quds Force, and so forth. It's very hard to see how you break that catalyst. But... To me, again, the way to do it is you reach agreements 
which are in our mutual interest, like the JCPOA, and try to build from there. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I wanted to, before I open it up uh, for discussion, I, I have one, one um, footnote comment. Um, I, I think your um, um, analysis and conclusion that President Carter is really the most uh, unappreciated president um, is uh, clear um, and uh, we have to look at this again and again because the point the, point, the point that you made and discussed the uh, peace process, the Camp David and the peace agreement with Egypt, many of uh, the observers and even analysts, they don't realize that at that time, President Carter actually planted the seeds for continuity and change uh, in the Middle East uh, for the cause of peace. By that I'm saying is that not only the peace that you discussed with Egypt, but the peace agreement with Jordan, and subsequently you refer to some of the other Arab countries, even Saudi Arabia. And uh, as, as we speak, uh, as we know, the efforts to bring in other partners, even an agreement between uh, the US, Israel, and Morocco, for example. And just a couple of days ago, um, Netanyahu uh, visited to Uganda and met with the leaders of the Sudan which really means uh, to reach out even to the Muslim or non-Muslim uh, Africa. So the point is to stress, again, that kind of contribution, that it's not only the peace uh, with uh, Egypt, but to pave a way for the future. And this is quite encouraging. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, uh... In both Camp David and in the treaty, Prime Minister Begin agreed to quote unquote, full autonomy for the Palestinians. Now, no one frankly knew what that meant. I'll be frank with you. It was not a state at that point. Um, there were 17,000 settlers in January of 1981 when Carter left, 450,000 now. It's much more difficult to do. Saul Linowitz, who was our negotiator for the Panama Canal Treaty, one of the things, by the way, that I mentioned in a book because it really helped establish a new relationship with Latin America, um, was the negotiator for the full autonomy. We, again, didn't have the PLO to negotiate with. We were negotiating with indigenous West Bank Palestinians, but then when we lost the election, the Reagan administration and subsequent administrations just lost interest in it until Clinton and, and Obama. Um, I'd like okay. to make one okay. announcement over here. We have two microphones going around for your questions. If you can hold the microphone vertically, it picks up your voice better than it does. If Hi, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm Dan Pollock from the Zionist Organization of America. My main question is, you say that the, uh, that the um, danger of drifting without thinking about it towards a one-state solution, which would be an existential disaster for Israel. How come the Palestinians and the Arabs in general don't seem to realize that if Israel is going to destroy itself, this is a viable option? In <laughs> other words, why is this not a viable strategy? And if I have, I know other people only ask questions. I have another question very quickly about President Carter and his post-presidency attitude towards Jews and Israel. If you have any comments on why became sure. so much more anti Israel than he was. Well, first of all, I, I've, I've known for like, I don't know, 30 years, Mort Klein, who heads your, I guess he still heads it. Um, and we've always had a, we've disagreed on a lot of things. We've always had a respectful. So, I mean, I think that in answer to your first question, this is not true of what I would call the Arab street. But one of the points I was trying to make in the latter part of my presentation is the Arab 
leaders have gone beyond the Palestinians. And they're basically saying, we're doing business with Israel. Maybe we can't do it as overtly as we could if there was an agreement, but, you know, in terms of trade and so forth, but covertly we are doing it. Um, Excuse me? Arab leaders outside of Palestine. Yes. Yes. I mean, the Sunni Arab leaders outside of, uh, of the Palestinian territories. Um, why are the Palestinians not doing more? It's an interesting question, and I, I, I don't pretend to be an expert on the Palestinians, but I, I still deal with, with some. And um, I think it's a combination of things. First of all, they saw the results of the first and second intifadas. They know if there was a third intifada, it would be a disaster for them. And they don't want another Syria. On a per capita basis, with all the problems that they have, their per capita income is much higher. I mean, I'm not talking about the oil rich countries, but I mean, basically Egypt and Jordan and so forth. Uh, and, and so even with all the restrictions, they still see themselves better off than, you know, many of their, many of their colleagues. Um, let me give you two anecdotes. So two years ago at the Aspen Ideas Festival, where I spoke in my book, there was a dinner uh, that was chaired by uh, Leonard Lauder and by Paul Singer. And Paul Singer is no dove on Israel. And so there were two speakers. One was uh, Halevi, who has written this lovely book about letters to my Palestinian neighbors. And the other was a fellow named Masri, who started a new town in the West Bank called Ramadi. And he said in his presentation, I'm the Catalan Palestinian the Israelis should love. I accept Israel as a Jewish state. I'm against BDS. I want to have our own state, yes, but I want to build uh, the economy up. I'm building a model city. I've got mixed housing and light industrial. And he said, it took me two years to get a water hookup. And there was only a one-lane road he said, how does that promote Israel's security? Does he know what he's doing to take up the water? Hookup well, <laughs> it's not a problem in the, I can assure you, the people who are settlers don't have a problem with water. Um, so the other is uh, a friend of mine, who uh, David Harmon, who's the son of the former ambassador, Abe Harmon, and who he was a long-time president of Hebrew University, and so David has taught a course at Hebrew University and Al-Quds University, which is a sort of leading university. And he says, it takes my students sometimes two hours to get to class. Now, if you've got a wall, fine. But, I mean, this just builds irritation. So, you know, whether you call it a state or not, there needs to be a separation. And the Palestinians need to be treated as positively as possible to have an equity and a peaceful outcome. Yes. Yeah. I'll get a microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, you've, the one with the mic has got the power, so. Sure, thank you very much for your remarks. My name is Lucas Lanzan, I'm a Swiss uh, student at Georgetown, and I would be curious to know from you, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, the vacuum that the U.S. is, is leaving behind in, in the Middle East, and maybe if we compare the speech that President Obama gave in the beginning of his presidency uh, in Cairo, uh, promising a new start for American Muslim relations and Middle Eastern relations, and then if you compare it to his yeah. end when he, of his presidency, for example, the article in the Atlantic by, uh, by Goldberg, where President Obama sounded quite disappointed, uh, what would be a better alternative to an American uh, strategy uh, for the Middle East uh, for this administration or, or a future uh, U.S. administration 
taking into account the, let's say, increasing tiredness or unwillingness of the American public to be involved in what the president calls uh, endless wars. Yes. So first of all, when you mentioned Switzerland, one thing that Yona didn't mention is that I, during all the Obama administration, I had a second title, which was special representative on Holocaust issues, and I negotiated uh, $8 billion there and seven, another $9 billion since, including a billion and a quarter dollars from Swiss banks. That's another story. So I think what um, Obama made a mistake uh, in his address in Cairo in two ways. The first is, which he later amended, to make it appear that the only reason why there was a state of Israel was the Holocaust. Uh, but second, not going to Israel. He went from Cairo to Saudi Arabia. And that, that was the wrong signal. Oh, it's fine to go to Saudi Arabia too, but you need to go to Israel. I mean, if you want lessons, I mentioned trusted intermediary. Israel's got to have the sense, and this is the tragedy of this peace process, this peace plan, because, you know, Trump is very popular in Israel, more popular than here. And he therefore would have the credibility to get Israel to make the kind of concessions, to have the kind of plan, not this sort of checkerboard type of state with tunnels and so forth, uh, to, to pull it off. And I think that, that, that President Obama didn't have the full confidence. Now, having said that also, when, when you mentioned the blue and white and Gantz, just like politics has changed here, it's changed in Israel also. And I've seen it when I go, again, as I said, I've probably gone 50 times. If you, if you, and I've seen the polls recently, you ask a simple question, do you still support a two-state solution? 60% say yes, but 60% say they don't see how it happens because there's no Palestinian partner. But the demographics of Israel are dramatically different than they were during the Carter years and, and even over the last 10, 15 years. You have a million Russians who have come in who are very hardline, uh, anti-Arab, uh, have no democratic tradition. They've certainly learned it, but I mean, they're very hardline. The Haredi population is 12% of the uh, Israeli public and growing. Um, the settlers are not, I mean, I mentioned 77% are in the three settlement blocks. Most of those are not what you would call sort of zealots. They're there because it's cheap housing and it's close to Jerusalem. Um, but the settler movement is very politically strong. And so when you combine the Russians and the settlers and the Haredi, you have a coalition that's very difficult in terms of any compromises to make. Now, I mean, the one thing that could make Bibi prime minister again is if Lieberman, the leader of the sort of Russian party, decides contrary to what he said, which he would never join a coalition with the Haredi party, to do so, then you would have you would have 61 votes. But it's a very hard right coalition. And it's just like politics in the West in general, the US, the middle is evaporated. <laughs> the Republican Party is going to the right, Democratic Party is going to the left. And the middle is just totally hollowed out. And that's what's happened in Israel. I mean, the Labor Party is, a, you know, hardly a shadow of itself in what it had been. Uh, right there. Mike, over there. Identify yourself. Uh, no, they believe. Um, my question is about coming. Surely. But that's a dirty word here, don't you know? <laughs> Bipartisanship and compromise are four-letter words with extended alphabet. Yes, but today, the 
about Big Hill and the West Bank is heading toward a one state solution. Isn't this to a great extent due to the policy of the Trump administration, which is not to I mean, it's accelerated it, but it's, it would be unfair to blame all of this on him. No, I mean, I think some of it, yes, it's accelerated with, with the fact of not trying to be a trusted intermediary. But it's really also, as I've said, the constant rejection by the Palestinians of very generous offers. Um, and the sense that the Israeli public has that they don't have a negotiating partner. Yes, it's certainly been accelerated now. Uh, it makes it impossible. There's no Palestinian who could accept the plan that was put on the table, but then they didn't accept others either. So let me just take, I, I really have to, I'd, I'd like to send some books and maybe we can take one last. Yeah. All right. And then I'm from this area. I went to the Charles E. Smith Jewish Day School, and I attended. Uh, well, so did my kids. Or Kodesh. Uh, <laughs> and so do I. Yes. Yeah, so I've been actually privileged of listening to you discuss these topics for the entirety of my life, with increasingly levels. You want to change the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Why don't you give the gentleman the microphone? And this is the last question with a microphone. Along the way, this is where I am today, and I'm looking at this plan. I sort of bring you down into just conceptually for how I try to think about it, four components. There's the there's the framework, there's the map, there's the depiction of the facts on the ground, and then there is the methodology of getting the Palestinians to the table. Okay, uh, what I'm kind of taking away from you is that you like see benefit in the framework, you see No, I don't see benefit in the framework. See okay. I see benefit in the economic part of the framework. Parts of the framework. You see not much benefit to the map. You do not like the way that the Palestinians are being brought to the table. And what about the, the facts on the ground as described? Well, I mean, that's what I've said. The facts on the ground have grown from 17,000 to 450,000. And that what Israel should do, and, and I've said, that, I mean, Dennis Ross and I chair also something called the Jewish People's Policy Institute of Jerusalem. And we, we've talked to, he, uh, to the prime minister and the cabinet, and we said, look, build the additional settlements in the settlement blocks, which are going to be part of Israel under any agreement, but don't keep sending them deeper and deeper and deeper into the West Bank. I mean, it's not just that it's not a nice thing. These are people who need to be separated and given space. So the facts on the ground are very complicated, yeah. but that's why Again, instead of making them worse, we ought to build up the settlement blocks and then ultimately give the settlers in those 82 settlements the choice of being citizens of a Palestinian state or being given economic incentives to resettle elsewhere in Israel. And regarding the methodology being used to bring them to the table, right? I think that most administrations have really tried to use the balance of the carrot, think probably more so the carrot, this time very clearly. Um, do you see that having some effectiveness? Do you think that this it would be effective if we could get the Sunni states to actually collaborate and say, "Look, you've got to come to the table now." And because the plan is so imbalanced, it's more difficult for them to do so. If it had any semblance of of balance, then the Sunni states, I think, would be much more willing to do it. So they're not willing to criticize it, but I don't think they're willing to put pressure on the Palestinians to make that the basis of coming to the table. Um, uh, Yona's going to thank our speaker. Yona? Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. And um, again, I encourage people to pick up their uh, the book. I see that one of our colleagues, a diplomat from Bulgaria, already has a book. So um, you will have an opportunity to look at this and to learn about the future developments in the Middle East and around the world. Thank you very much. Thank again. you.
Thank you.